Hi, this is Mark Costco in Jackson, Mississippi. I'd like to share an interesting case of a young 30-year-old female uh, who had an obviously visually significant cataract um, related to um, chronic steroid use for her myasthenia gravis. Uh, we have stained with blue, uh, probably not absolutely necessary, but uh, it will decrease the elasticity of the capsule and these younger patients. And I wanted to have the option of staining the posterior capsule later, um, although I, I don't think I ended up doing that. Um, so we're just making first our anterior capsular axis. Um, these are MST style capsular axis forceps. I have no financial interest. Uh, we're going to hydrodissect and hydrodelineate right there, and then we'll rotate the lens. Um, the main reason I want to show this video is to just talk about um, young people having cataract surgery. Uh, there seems to be a, a push towards younger and younger uh, patients uh, for cataract surgery, whether it's uh, cosmetic clear lens extraction and the late 40s, early 50s. Um, um, I think that there needs to be more talk about doing the surgeries in a way that's going to, quote, last, end quote, the, for the patient. Um, and so I think it's very important to get all of your lens epithelial cells out um, and to do things that make it easier to later exchange the lens should you ever want or need to. Um, a young patient like this who's 30, we're essentially 100% certain that she would eventually have to have a YAG, uh, no matter how well we meticulously polished stuff. Um, so we know that she'll eventually have to have a YAG. Well, if she has a YAG, you're gonna have a jagged posterior capsular edge. Um, notice, notice I keep the eye sort of inflated as I do this. She's young, she has no PVD. Um, so if I let the chamber collapse, I'm putting traction on the retina in, in a roundabout way maybe. Um, I could do this step right here, cortical cleanup, extremely fast if I wanted to. But I'm much more concerned with um, getting every last strand of the cortex. And if you take the time to grab the anterior uh, wisps, if you will, of the cortex. It'll strip more cleanly. Uh, here we're going to meticulously polish the capsular bag as well as the underside of the anterior capsule. Um, this will significantly decrease soma rings as well as fibrosis as the decades go by. Uh, now what we're doing is um, partially filling the capsular bag, but, but also putting, uh, oh, actually, no, not yet. Uh, here what I'm doing is polishing the underside of the capsular bag even more. Uh, but just to comment more on why you would do a posterior capsulotomy, um, if you do a YAG later instead, you're going to have a jagged edge to the posterior capsule, which makes it harder to uh, put a new lens in the bag if years later you exchange, but if it's a continuous curvilinear posterior capsulotomy, all your options are open. You've not violated the anterohyloid. Uh, you've got a capsular fornix that will work with one-piece lenses. Um, I, I think in select cases, not certainly not in every case, but in select cases, I think it's worth considering this. I first heard uh, Lisa Arbiser advocate for this. Uh, and then uh, Jason Jones advocate for this um, in select cases. Um, and Jason Jones has a video or two on this that's honestly even better than mine here. Here I'm functioning, puncturing posterior capsule with a 25 gauge. I'm going in that tiny posterior capsular defect that I just made with Viscoat uh, to fill uh, burger space. Uh, and I take some time to do this, um, just really slow and careful. Um, when I first heard those um, 
living legends uh, described this, I thought they were crazy. I, I think I was a resident at the time and I was like, why would anybody ever do that? Uh, that's unnecessary risk. You can see as I came out with my cannula, I got the small tear a little bit earlier than I wanted to, uh, but that's okay. I'm putting some biscuit on top of it now. And now I'm gonna do the actual posterior rexus. Um, it feels way different than an anterior capsulotomy. For one, it's significantly thinner tissue. Um, but at any rate, I thought they were crazy when I first heard them describe this. Um, but I've, over the years, started thinking about it more, and I, I think that there is a time and a place for this. Um, it just seems to preserve options down the road. Uh, and if you do it controlled, it's really not as risky as you think. This patient uh, is not vitrectomized. Um, uh, um, but my first few cases of doing this, I did it on vitrectomized eyes uh, to sort of get used to it. And I would advise that uh, to anyone watching if they are interested in adopting this technique. Uh, first try it on vitrectomized eyes and you'll kind of get to where you're like oh well that that wasn't so crazy that wasn't so difficult uh, and then you can do it on eyes that are not vitrectomized and it's really fine um, so um, here I'm inflating the capsular fornix with ProVisc um, to, to learn the actual technique of that um, you might watch Jason Jones's videos. If you search his, I think his is even better than mine. Um, this is a J&J uh, &J ZC Boo, um, and it injects really controlled. Um, I recommend this lens because it is, um, it's not gonna get glistenings as the decades go by. It's got very excellent optics. Um, it um, is, is very non-reactive with the capsule, like there's very little fibrosis of capsule against J&J &J, um, acrylic. Um, so it just, other than some adhesions at the optic haptic junction to the capsule, years later you're just not going to have trouble getting this lens out. Um, I will say this patient had um, a lot of eyelid issues and sort of like, you know, the upper half of the eye was struggling with ptosis and the lower half was struggling with exposure. So I, I just did a, a monofocal, some cefuroxime antibiotic and that's gonna uh, complete it. And I have a little video of my son doing a tiny ski jump. All right, here comes Wardy, go Wardy. Great job, Wardy! <laughs> great job, guys. That was great. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching.